Yeah, so we're going to talk about lipids today. And I just want to point out that uh, lipids are very complex. And in one hour, we can't cover everything. So we're going to try to do as best we can to pull out the most important concepts for those who want to do lipidomics and want to get started and have kind of a good background. So who, who here has actually done lipidomics or plans to? OK, a fair amount. So if anybody has any questions about anything I covered today, feel free to raise your hand, or you can talk to me after my lecture. Or you can also email me, too, as well, and I can respond. So we've actually known about lipids for quite a while. In the 1700s, there was researchers that were looking at the blood of animals that were eating foods. And they noticed that the blood had a milky consistency. And that was lipids. And it wasn't until maybe the mid-1900s that we started to try to measure them. And gas chromatography is one of the more popular methods that was used during that time to look at fatty acids. The thing they were interested in looking at was the influence of fatty acids in our diet and that relationship with our health. In the early 2000s, and actually 2003, so it's been 20 years since this idea of the lipidome arised. And this is now looking at not just the fatty acids, which are the building block lipids, but also looking at all the intact complex lipids as well. So we want to try to look at as many lipid species as possible. And you can see here, we're looking at the number of publications uh, searching for lipidomics and mass spectrometry. You can see a steady rise in how this has been used in the field. And more recently, um, it's starting to explode. And um, a lot of this has to do with how lipids can be used. So this is an oversimplification, but lipids, just like metabolites, are the end products of a lot of upstream actions. And because of this, they're very closely related to the phenotype. And in addition to this, lipids are very ubiquitous in the body. They're at systemic levels, at tissue levels, at the cellular level, and they're involved in a lot of different biological activities. So you might have heard of cell, uh, lipids being used in cell membrane in terms of structure and function. There's mediator lipids that are important for information pathways. There's uh, fat storage lipids, a whole host of lipids. And this is what has given lipids a lot of interest in the fields of looking at disease, uh, stress, exposure, and diet. So when a new student comes to my lab, they I want to do lipidomics, I tell them measuring lipids is easy. You can fall out of bed and get lipids, right? They are uh, very ubiquitous. The extraction is straightforward. They're typically found at high concentrations. And their structures are often predictable. However, the challenge is in doing this, uh, measuring them and reporting lipids properly. And this is what we're going to spend a lot of time on today. So before we get into the methods, let's go over a lot of what I consider challenges for looking at lipids. If we understand the challenges, then we can understand how to devise experiments and to look at those lipids that we want to. But also, more importantly, when we get the results, we can do better interpretation, understand the data. So if you look at lipid maps, which is a great resource for anybody that wants to do lipids, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail later, there's almost 48,000 lipids. That's a lot. And if you look at the different classes of lipids in this table, there's eight classes. You can see that there are a lot of lipids in different types of classes. And so if we look at, for example, the fatty acyls, which are the smallest building block lipids, there's over 10,000 of these. That's a lot of things that we have to mine through. As we start to build more complex lipids, so in this case, we have, we have um, triglyceride. Does this work? I don't think it works. Okay. On the bottom there, we have a triglyceride that has a glycerol backbone, and you have three fatty acids attached. And those three fatty acids could be any various combinations of fatty acids. And you can see how now we can start building this into a lot of different lipid structures. If you look at just one lipid class in specific, like the glycerol phospholipids, we have three separate parts of this lipid. We have our acyl chains, we have our glycerol backbone, and we have a polar head group. And for this, we can actually have up to seven different types of head groups that you can attach onto that part where there's an X. And we also can manipulate or change different types of acyl chains. So you can have uh, fatty acids attached with different tail lengths. And you can have different amounts of saturation or double bonds. And you can place those double bonds in different places. And you also can change how the fatty acids are attached in SN1 or SN2 position. And that's a lot of detail. And it's very important that det this detail is why or it actually determines what biological activity this lipid has. If we come at this from an analysis standpoint, <clears throat> there are lots of different levels that we can describe these lipids. 
So if you want to just look at a lipid class, for example, you can use things like thin layer chromatography, NMR, or single stage mass spec. But that doesn't really tell us much, right? So we want to look at the next level of detail. And this would be what we call the sum composition. So in the sum composition, we have a PE, which stands for phosphatidylethanolamines. We have a 36. And this represents a number of carbons in the two fatty acyl tails. Okay? And then the last number is a number of double bonds. So this basically tells us that there's some combination of two fatty acids that have uh, 36 carbons and one double bond. And we can get this information using what we call shotgun lipidomics or independent or data dependent acquisition using uh, shotgun or LCM SMS. In this case, we have one ID, right? We've got one sum, comp sum composition. But maybe that's not enough detail, right? We want more detail. <clears throat> so this is, in this case, let's say we have an idea of what the fatty acids are that are attached. So we have 36 colon 1, so they have to equal 36 colon 1. So in this case, we have a 16O and a 20 colon 1, an 18O and 18 one, and so forth. So let's say we have five that we have identified as potential fatty acid compositions. Notice here that we have an underscore. And this is a really important thing. So the underscore basically tells anybody who's looking at your data that we know what the fatty acids are, but we don't know how they're oriented. We don't know if there's in the beginning, the first position, or the second position. <clears throat> but let's say we have five, right? And most people with the traditional lipidomics assays, they, they get to this point. Oops, sorry. They get to this point. So they get the information about which fatty acids are attached, but they don't know what position they're in. If we add additional methods, like iMobility, or something that uses some kind of reactions, we can start getting more detail. So if we get to the fatty acid positional level, we use a slash. And the slash basically indicates that we, are not, we now know which orientation they are in. <clears throat> if we do that, we've doubled our potential IDs of lipids that we have to try to figure out which one we have of those 10. If we go a step further and look at double bond position, we could have upwards of 28 lipids. And if you look at stereochemistry, we have 56. And so the more detail we get, the more lipids that are possible that we have to identify which one we're looking at among these. And this is where in, in, information about what we get from the mass spectrometer is very important. So as we think of something like structural resolution, we have a certain amount of information that our mass spectrometer that we use or the scanning strategy we use give us. And that information allows us to say something about what we know about the structure. So in this case, maybe you have something very simple where we have uh, the, the sum composition, right? We know we have a certain head group here that's phosphatidylcholine, and we know the, the number of carbons and double bonds in the tails. And maybe we do MSMS, and we get information about which tails we have, right? We have a 16 and 18 but we don't know which one is an SN1 or SN2 positions. We can go a step further, again, and do experiments where we get the positional isomers. And lastly, we can get more information about those double bonds. What I want to point out here is that false positives, we think of those as lipids that are not really real, right? But we're saying they're real. It's also a false positive to over-report the structural information you have about what, what, what information you're getting from your mass spectrometer. So if you don't have information that is coming from the mass spec that allows you to tell you which uh, positional isomers they are, you can't report that. So it's really important that you annotate and show the lipids to the structural information you have. Two other things that are uh, kind of a challenge. Um, as I said, we have a lot of lipids. So we have a lot of overlap. And we have uh, isobars. And these are lipids that have the same atomic or they have a atomic or molecular species with the same nominal mass, but different exact masses. So here, this is a case where something like high resolution mass spectrometry can help us out. We also have isomers, and these have the same atomic composition, but different line formula or different stereochemical formula. In this case, we would want to use something like chromatography to help us separate these out. But knowing that these things exist and that there's a lot of these things that happen within a sample allow us to devise experiments that help us get through to this. So we've been talking a lot about identifications, but there's also an issue of concentration. So this is a plot that shows different lipid classes that are detected in plasma, human plasma. And you can see here, looking at the bottom axis, the concentration ranges that, for example, uh, single myelins, you can have from about uh, 10 nanomole per liter up to maybe 100 micromole per liter. That's a huge concentration range that we have to measure. 
And you can see here that this fluctuates across all the different types of groups. And this puts a strain on our analytical methodology. Even within a, a, a particular matrix like plasma, in a cohort, let's say we have a, a SRM 1950, which is a pooled plasma material, but we also have a high triglyceride pool, a diabetic pool, and an African-American pool. Even within this pool, we see large dramatic differences between concentrations. And why is this important? Well, I had a student who was doing some work with colon tissue, and they looked at healthy colon tissue and fatty colon tissue. And we got a total ion chromatogram that looked like this. And does anybody know what this, what's wrong with this? Anyway, by, by the way, any guesses? Yeah, saturation. So, um, you know, when they ran the healthy tissue, everything looked fine. When they ran the fatty tissue, you have this saturation. So what appear looks like to me is that those peaks are being cut off. And so I told the student to dilute this one 10 times. And you can actually see that, you know, maybe getting a little bit better resolution of those peaks. And if you go further to one 100th dilution, now you can see that those triglycerides that are down there are much more intense than what we were looking at before. And if you even go further, one in 1,000, it's even more resolved. And what's important to show here is that um, in the top one, the phospholipids and sphingomyelins are actually looking pretty robust. But as we dilute and dilute and dilute, those get smaller and smaller. So the challenge here when you're doing your extraction and you're revising your experiment is to make sure that you can look at those concentrated lipids and those trace lipids at the same time if you have to dilute them. So we've talked about having a lot of lipids in a sample, and there's a lot of diversity. And so here's a Venn diagram of um, that pooled sample with a high, high triglyceride, a diabetic, and African American. You can see there are a lot of lipids that overlap, and there are a lot of lipids that are different. And if we were just to zoom in on the pooled sample, if you look at this, the number of species of different lipid classes uh, versus the concentration, you'll notice that uh, there's a lot of lipids that are very small in terms of number of species, but comprise a large amount of concentration. So cholesterol esters, for example, um, only have 19, but they represent about half of the concentration of lipids in your blood. So it's a very interesting dynamic of how the number of lipids doesn't always necessarily mean that you have the highest concentration. This is a really great review. I strongly recommend those to check it out. Um, this is focused on, on blood for lipidomics, um, but a lot of these uh, concepts that they talk about in this paper can apply to just about anything. And they cover all the pre-analytical steps, all the things that you do when you kind of come together with your experimental design, you, you, you put your cohort together, that might have an influence on the results you might obtain in your experiment. It also talks about the analytical side, so actually when you're going through your process of doing your analysis, you know, what are the things that might have an influence in your data, and then also uh, post-analytics, how do we interpret the data, how do we make sure the data is of good quality. <clears throat> Uh, in the instance of time, we're going to just go ahead and start with the lipid extraction. So the two gold standard lipid extraction methods are the Fulch and the Bly Dyer. Now these methods were devised in the 50s, so they've been around for a long time, and they're predominantly the most widely used extraction methods. What I want to point out, though, is that the Bly Dyer was done with fish tissue, and the Fulch was done with brain tissue. And why is this important? Well, each of those tissues have different fat content. Right? And any biphasic extraction, we have two, layer, two layers. We have an organic layer and we have an aqueous layer. And we use a certain ratio of solvents to get us these two layers. And that ratio of solvents is predetermined by the fat content that we're expecting in the sample. So unless you're doing things with fish or brain tissue, you really should be optimizing the ratio of those solvents for the fat content in your samples to get the best extraction. So the main extraction methods that you might see in the field are the Bly, Dyer, and Fulch. And here are the recipes in terms of the ratios of chloroform, methanol, and water. Another method that's gained some popularity is the Matyash method. And this is, uses MTBE. The great thing about MTBE is that it's less dense than water. So the lipid layer sits on top. So it's easier for removing. Um, <clears throat> just basically going through, we typically would weigh our sample, blood, or tissue. We add our solvents at the particular ratios that we desire to. We centrifuge, and then we do our extraction. So here's a, I have a small video that's basically going to show, if it, make sure it plays, <clears throat> how the extraction takes place. So you can see there's two layers. You have aqueous layer, you have a cell debris layer, and then you also have the bottom chloroform layer. You'll notice that 
my postdoc will start to expel air and you'll see bubbles. This is so we don't in, in get any of the aqueous layer into our uh, extractor we're collecting. And then we get to the bottom and we start to pull out that chloroform layer that contains all the lipids. We transfer this to another tube. And then if you want to be a hero, you can try to get the rest of the extract. Um, <clears throat> and we eventually will take that extract. Now you can also re-extract, so you can add chloroform again to try to improve your recovery. Um, but we take that final extract, we evaporate it down to dryness, reconstitute it, add it to the all sample vial, and then we do our analysis. For uh, trying to do quantification, um, most of what you'll see in literature is what I call semi-quantitative. So typically you have some stable isotope of at least maybe you try to get at least one per lipid class that you're trying to measure. And you want that to be preferably co-ionized with the other compounds of that class. And on the right here, we have two different types of um, more popular um, mixes for internal standards. We have the, the splash mix and equisplash that are made from Avanti polar lipids. Uh, two big differences here are the splash is made custom for plasma. So the concentrations of the individual lipids uh, vary based on what they expect to see in plasma. And here it's about uh, 100 samples for uh, $600, so it's not necessarily cheap. Um, and you do 10 microliters per sample. Uh, we typically use the Equisplash mix, and this is, uh, basically has all of them at the same concentration. So what we can do with this is we can dilute that mix any way we want for whatever matrices we're looking for, and we can actually get maybe more samples out of it if we can make it uh, a certain concentration range that fits for our matrix. So I think for me, this is the more optimal one, but if you're working with plasma, this may be a better choice. For quantitation, we do a single point calibration with internal standards. It's pretty straightforward. We know the sample signal. We know how much internal standard we put in. We know our internal standard signal so we can solve for our amount of lipid. If you're not necessarily interested in quantity, a lot of people do a relative quantification. And here, we don't really necessarily care about the actual numbers. We care about whether or not two groups compare. Right? We want to see if something goes up or down. And here, consistency is the key. So we want to make sure that everything we're doing is consistent across the board. And if anybody tells you they do absolute quantification with lipidomics, they're lying, because you can't actually do that. You have to have a stable isotope for every lipid you're measuring, and that does not exist. But there are new isotopically labeled standard mixes that are becoming available. There's a new one they came out with. I think that has close to 150. And so we're getting closer, uh, but we're definitely not there yet. So now we have our lipid extract, what do we do next? So I like this plot because it shows on the y-axis the number of compounds and on the x-axis the, the masses of compounds. And you can see here that for certain classes you have a lot of lipids bunched up together over a short mass range. There's a lot of compounds and we have to figure out what those are. And so things we need to discuss are how are we introducing the compounds into the mass spectrometer and then also, how are we ionizing them? And that's what we're going to cover over the next few slides. So you might have heard of direct infusion or shotgun lipidomics. And uh, typically, almost all the stuff I'm going to show today is going to be electrospray, although there is work that's done with MALDI. Well, we won't have time to talk about that today. And with uh, direct infusion or shotgun lipidomics, it's very straightforward. Uh, basically, you have a syringe pump or some other device that slowly infuses your extract into the mass spectrometer at a, at a certain flow rate. And this is, is when we acquire our data. So there's no separation involved. The benefit of this is that everything occurs under identical ex experimental conditions. So you have a constant lipid solution that's going in under the same uniform environment. And that allows for uh, a better quantitative uh, result in some cases. We also have uh, what we call flow injection analysis, or FIA. And here, we use the LC, uh, but we don't have no columns. So the LC, the auto sampler takes our extract, it slowly diffuses the extract into a mobile phase that goes straight into the mass spec at a, at a slow rate and allows you to look at a certain amount of lipids over a period of time. And we'll cover this in a little more detail uh, in a little bit. So one thing about lipids that is important to know is that a lot of them form adducts. So, um, there are some lipids that f form protonated species, like your phospholipids. Uh, 
Um, but a lot of lipids form addicts. And there's different types of addicts that can be formed. And which addict you form is actually really important. So this is an example of a cholesterol ester, 16 CE. In the top, you can see a sodium addict. And you might notice a very intense uh, molecular ion, but you see very little fragmentation. That's because sodium addicts do not generate good fragmentation. And this is important because fragmentation is what we're going to be using to identify what lipids they are. But if you add lithium, which is a very common um, additive for uh, direct infusion experiments, you can see now we have a very robust fragmentation profile that allows us to identify what that species is. If we look at this on the side of doing uh, LC, uh, based lipidomics, a lot of us use our ammonium addicts. And ammonium addicts have the same benefit that you see with lithium in that they generate a really robust fragmentation profile that allows us to use that information to identify what the lipids are. With electric spray, um, you know, I told you before, one reason why li lipidomics is somewhat quantitative is we, we use, maybe use one or maybe a couple internal standards per class. And typically, they're saturated lipids. And we know that lipids have double bonds. They have their varying carbon numbers. And so what influence do those double bonds and carbon numbers have on how the lipids are measured? Well, it turns out a lot. So in this case, we look at, at a bunch of different cholesterol esters. And on that first line there, you see zero double bonds. And you can see from 619 to 703, we're basically adding more carbon. So we're adding the more to the chain length. And you can look at, at equal moral concentration, adding more chain link doesn't change how much intensity you have for those cholesterol esters. But as soon as we start adding double bonds, our intensity increases dramatically. And so double bonds for cholesterol esters have a very large impact on how they're ionized. And this is one reason why the results we get when we do quantitation is semi-quantitative at best, because the responses vary from saturated to unsaturated. Interestingly, if you look at of phosphatidylcholines um, for saturated uh, addicts, as the chain length increases, your mass spec res response goes down. So they have an opposite effect. And if you look at the effect of saturation on PCs, it has very little effect. And this has a lot to do with where ionization is occurring on the molecule. So in PCs, ionization typically occurs at the head group, whereas um, the tails are much more impactful in the ionization process for things like CEs and triglycerides. One thing that should be really um, focused on, and they're starting to get a little more attention, is this idea of in-source fragmentation. Has anybody heard of this before? OK. So during ionization, if you don't have optimal conditions, you can actually lead to what's called in-source fragmentation, uh, which can lead to false negatives and false positives. <clears throat> and so what happens here? is if the conditions aren't optimal, you can have something like a 16-0-LPC, LPC, lysophosphatidylcholine, and it actually can break that down to now having a lysopE and a fatty acid. So you originally had the 16-0-LPC, but now we've generated two different lipids that we might see. And there's a few studies that have been shown where if you change something like ion transfer temperature, as you change it, you actually start to see the rate of ionization efficient, uh, ion is, uh, in source fragmentation increase. So, this is something that you definitely need to be aware of when you're doing your analysis and you're optimizing your, your method. Does anybody have an idea of how you can mitigate this? Change the voltage for your sure, yeah, yeah, you can optimize the settings. But one thing you have to consider is that when you're doing lipidomics, you're looking across many different classes, right? So, there's always a compromise, right? Um, and it's interesting that like lysophosphatidylcholines are actually a very common biomarker for a lot of disease conditions. So you know, there's something we want to definitely make sure we're measuring correctly. Um, so but anyways, we're, with in-source fragmentation, we're talking about the source, right? So at that point, it's already gone through chromatography. So chromatography is actually one way that we can look at how do we distinguish where these compounds are coming from. Because by the time they get to the source, they've already been separated. So it's just really important that when you look through your data, you focus on these kinds of aspects if you're seeing something that doesn't look right. All right, so we're going to start going into the analysis portion of looking at lipids. So we, we, we're going to talk briefly about the shotgun approaches, and then we're going to get into LCMS approaches next. The basis of shotgun um, is that we don't have any separation. So we, don't, we have this big glob of lipid that's getting to our mass spec. We have to find some way to tease out those individual lipids. And we have, what, what can we use for that? We're going to use their structure. 
Right? So we maximize the unique chemical and physical properties of either the classes, subclasses, or individual species. We can use that information to pull them out of this glob of lipids, and we can identify and potentially quantify what those lipids are. And most methods that do this approach use triple quads. Right? So in the triple quads, you have the ability to make product ion scans, precursor ion scans, neutral loss scans, and now more recently, uh, selected reaction monitoring or, or um, multiple reaction monitoring methods. We're going to talk about each of those in a minute. This idea is that we can have, let's say, three different lipids. We can look at the different structural ways that they're put together, and we can use that information to our advantage in pulling out individual lipids or subclasses of lipids from a sample. So if we look at product ion scan here, basically we have three lipids, M1, M2, M3. We're going to break them apart, and we're going to look at their fragmentation. Right? Fortunately for you, every, this has already been done by lots of people. So this information is already, already out there. But the idea is that each of these lipids have like a puzzle, unique fingerprints that we can use and pull out information. So one way to do that will be using what we call neutral loss scanning. So if you think of, let's say, cholesterol esters, cholesterol esters have a cholesterol backbone and they have a fatty acid attached, right? And then they differ by the fatty acids attached to them. So if we look at a specific neutral loss of the precursor mass to the mass of the loss of the cholesterol backbone, we can use that neutral loss to essentially create a profile that shows us all the cholesterol esters. And if we want to look at specific losses of fatty acids, we can use those neutral losses of those fatty acids and get individual species. Same thing we can do with uh, precursor ion scanning. So if you have, let's say, phosphatidylcholines, and all phosphatidylcholines have the same fragment of 184, and this is the phosphatidylcholine uh, head group. And we can use that head group as a way to pull out all the phosphatidylcholines in a sample. So they all share the same fragment. We can pull them out. Or we can look at specific fatty acids that they, all, that they each might have, and we can use those to pull out individual species as well. And what you can do is you can look at a lot of really great publications that go through all the different lipid classes. You can look at the types of ions that were detected as. You can look at the scan mode, the specific fragment that was used with the scan, information about uh, optimal collision energies, because this is a very important part of doing MSMS with a triple quad, right? And then information here about how much, how sensitive it was to look at those lipids. And so what you would end up doing is, this is kind of a deconstructed way of looking at the lipidome, right? We want to look at all these classes, and we can have experiments, which I'll show in a second. We can pull all these different fragmentation strategies and put them into a, a, a workflow, and I'll get all this information so we can get all these individual lipid classes, and we can start to pull together what we see in the whole lipidome. So, if we have something where we do the flow injection analysis or a shotgun lipidomics, so let's say we have 100 microliters of extract, we slowly dispense that into the mass spec at two microliters per minute, we have 50 minutes of scanning where we can do a whole series of those neutral loss, precursor ion, whatever scans you want for whatever lipid classes you want, you can start putting together into a workflow. So this is an example here of a workflow where every couple minutes it's looking at the neutral loss of a different fatty acid. And so it goes from 14-0 to 16-1 to 16 and so forth. And here we just zoom in on this, the, the fatty acid loss of 20 colon 1. And you can see a profile of all the lipid species there in red that have that fatty acid as part of their structure. And so you can pull together these really nice profiles. What you can do then is you can do all the different fatty acid types. And you can arrange them in a manner where you can actually see all the lipids that are present within this matrix that have those specific fatty acids. So you can start to take all that information and compile it in a way that might help you decide like whether or not certain fatty acids are showing up in certain lipid species and are indicative of maybe disease conditions or controls. Taking one step further, so that's kind of focused on looking at lipid classes, maybe subclasses. Um, there's new methods now you might have seen with the lipidizer, with the SIEX that use multiple reaction monitoring or selected reaction monitoring. And here we're looking at individual lipids. So we want to look at, let's say, uh, phosphatidylcholines, a 34 colon 2. You can start to pull together these transitions looking at pre a precursor and a, and a very specific fragment for that particular uh, lipid species. And, and it's just important to know that uh, both positive and negative mode are important. So positive mode is important because it tells us that we have a phosphatidylcholine head group at 184. Uh, but negative mode is also important because negative mode is actually where we're going to detect which fatty acids are attached. Anyways, you can compile a whole bunch 
of these transitions for all the lipid species that you were trying to measure. And we can import this into a method that's routinely scanned through these lipids when we expect them using uh, scheduled monitoring. And we can start to construct the entire lipidome with a, a vast targeted list of uh, lipid species. And I believe they have close to 1,000 uh, transitions that they have in their workflow. So uh, a lot of the newer methods, though, uh, sort of started to combine LC with high resolution mass spectrometry. And we're going to talk about what reasons are for that and then some of the benefits. So again, coming back to this, uh, we have this plot here that shows one of our lipids over the certain range. They're very bunched. So chromatography actually could be really helpful here, right? We can kind of spread out those particular species over a longer period of time, and we can now measure them over a longer period of time rather than in one plug. And high resolution mass spectrometry is really helpful too because now we can look at their accurate masses. Now we can use that as a way to identify uh, between things that are very similar. And now we can also look at the fragmentation as well. So now we have kind of three layers of information that we can use. So there are two main ways to do chromatography with lipidomics. Uh, one would be using reverse phase. And here we have a nonpolar stationary phase. And here we're going to be doing our separation by lipid species. So if you think of any one class, let's say phosphatidylcholines, they're going to separate by increasing carbon numbers. So the lowest carbon numbers ones will come up first, and they'll increase over time. Okay. And so one of the issues with this is that your intro standard will not come out at the same time as all the species in that group. So it's not co-ionized. And this can hamper your quantitation. The other way that people do this is with HILIC or normal phase, but HILIC is probably more, more popular. And here we're getting separation by lipid class. So here, all the PEs and PCs and single myelins all come out in one, one peak. And the benefit of this is that now we have co uh, elution or coionization with the internal standard, and this helps improve quantitation. Now, in my lab, we typically use reverse phase. And so we take the little bit of suffering we get with the quantitation. And we get the benefit of having more reproducible retention time. So if we have a large batch of samples where maybe we're running maybe for five or six days, uh, you want to make sure the retention times are very reproducible. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We oftentimes have trouble with HILIC and trying to maintain reproducible retention time. Or if we go from batch to batch, um, things change more than we like. We're able to sit better with the retention time um, with less drifting on the reverse phase, but both methods work. The beauty of high res in terms of doing lipidomics is that now we can look at different really closely related lipids that vary by very small differences in mass. So here we have pairs where you can see a lot of different lipid species. Sometimes they're overlapping with an isotope. Um, and we can see that the, the varying differences in mass get smaller and smaller. But if but we have a tool now where we can actually increase our resolving power, and we can now use that level to be able to separate those two species. So it affords us a lot of um, power to, to basically mine those lipids down to very small fragments of masses. So this is an example of what we call our non-target workflow for lipidomics. On the top, we have just a, a positive uh, mode total ion chromatogram. This is human feces. And we can see that we have a lot of separation between um, some of our smaller lipids, like lysophospholipids. And we have our phospholipids and single myelins and diacylglycerols. And then at the end, we have our tags and, and cluster esters. And what I want to point out is that we typically use this in our lab as a hypothesis driving experiment. So we maybe not know what the lipids are that are changing. We let the data tell us. And so we collect everything over a set mass range. We get all those ions that we think are potential lipids, and then we try to understand which they are with software. I just have a little video here that shows, you can see the red line at the top that's going over the trace of the TIC, and you can see here uh, a lot of different triglycerides that are coming in to the mass spec and then leaving. And, and What's also important to notice is that uh, there's obviously one really important, really highly concentrated lipid in each of these, but there's a lot of lipids that are down here as well. So. Um, there's a lot of information that we are generating from this sample. But what are we getting? We're getting accurate mass and retention time. And that tells us a lot, right? But there's a lot of lipids that would, could sit at a very similar accurate mass. And so we need to have 
some other means of getting to be able to identify what these lipids are. And that's where we use our data-dependent uh, MS2 top 10 analysis. And so here, I think this has been covered a little bit uh, at this conference, but basically we want to get all the MSMS -MS spectra, as many as we can, of all the lipids that are present in the sample. And so in one cycle, it takes a full scan, and then the top 10 most abundant lipids, it does MSMS -MS on those, comes back to a full scan, and continues over the course of the entire run. So this is just a quick video that shows, um, if I can get, yeah. it takes a full scan, and then you start seeing the MSMS -MS of all the different lipids it sees in the top 10 that were selected. And so if we're thinking about how we devise our experiment, and we have, let's say our samples, we have three groups, three, three groups in our cohort. We typically would do MS1, we do a full scan, in both positive and negative mode. The reason we do this is because it gives us the most points per peak. So if we wanna do quantitation, we wanna get a peak area, we want as many points per peak to give us the best peak shape as possible. But if we use the full scan from the DDA experiment, because of the time it takes to do all the cycling, we get only a handful of uh, full scan. And so our, our a handful of, of, of times we're actually doing the full scan. So our peak area may not be as good. So we want more points per peak, but we also need the MSMS. So what we do in our lab is we do everything with full scan, get uh, full scan spectra in positive, negative mode. We also do extraction blinks, which are very important to, for blank filtering. And we make pools. So we make a pool of each of the groups in our cohort, and we use the pools to do the data-dependent top end analysis. And what this does over the course of an entire run is it generates a sample pool of MSMS profiles that we can use to match. Now the key here for lipid identification in the full scan runs is that the accurate mass and the retention time have to be aligned. So you have to have good retention time. You can't have drifting, right? You have to, all the retention times have to sit. And we can do that. We can line the retention time of the MSMS -MS profiles with the retention time of the accurate mass of the same species in the MS1 profile. So if we do this and we go through a one set of looking at these MSMS -MS profiles, uh, we can generate a, a fair number of uh, lipid fragmentation profiles that we can use for identification, but it's really getting the top 10. And in, in most cases, the top 10 are lipids that are probably not the most interesting to look at. Usually the ones that are most concentrated are not the most interesting. So how do we get further down in selecting all those lipids that maybe are lower concentration, but maybe more biologically relevant to our study? And so one way to do that is a method through uh, iter exclusion. And with iter exclusion, basically, we do the same thing, you take a full scan, we select the precursors for MSMS, and then we, uh, after the first time through, after we get the MSMS profiles, we make an exclusion list. So we get a list of all the ions that were used to be picked for MSMS in the first injection. We add them as an exclusion list in the second one. So now, instead of taking, in this case, the top five, it takes the next top five. And we can continue doing this for as many times as you like. And now we have two sets of pools of MSMS -MS profiles we can use for identification from both runs. And just to illustrate what this looks like, sorry, it's a little slow. What this looks like is here you have your first injection and we have a second injection. So now we have more MSMS -MS that we've generated. We go to a third, a fourth, Sorry. Fifth and sixth. Oops. Sorry, it's going kind of slow. So here you can see now we've effectively done a lot in terms of increasing the amount of MSMS -MS spectra that we can use for identification in our sample. So when we think about identifying lipids, you know, we have a lot of information we have. Uh, retention time, we have its accurate mass, and we also have to know a little bit about the lipid structure and what the fragments we need that are set criteria that allow us to make a positive ID. So in this case, for this triglyceride, for 16-0, 16-0, 16-1, -16 we want to make sure we have the accurate mass and we have the retention time. And we also look for the neutral loss of the 16-0 and the neutral loss of the 16-1. We also look for the 16-0 and 16-1 ions. So 
there's a lot of criteria that we have, and this is something we set up for every single lipid class. We have criteria that we have to see for us to be able to give a positive identification. I mentioned before about having both positive and negative mode. This is really key because sometimes for some lipids, they actually provide information that helps us identify it from both modes. So for phosphatidylcholines, for example, you have a 34 colon 1, that's a protonated lipid. Here, what we want to look for is that 184, which is a phosphocholine head group. But we don't get much information in terms of the fatty acids attached. You get a lot of that, though, in negative mode. In negative mode, you get this 18-1 and 16-0 uh, loss fragment. So it's important to do both modes. There are a lot of different software that you can use once you have your data collected. We use Lipid Match Flow, but there's MS Style, there's Compton Discover, there's a whole host of these methods. Uh, what's great about Lipid Match Flow is it works with the strategy that I just talked about, where we have our pools and our sample and our blanks. So you basically drag all those samples into this nice GUI workflow that's just freely available, and there's YouTube videos if you want to know how to use this in better detail. What I also like about this method, uh, this software, is you know all the steps that it's going through when it does identification. So sometimes you have black box software, you don't really know what's happening. Here you can actually see that there's deconvolution happening, isotope grouping, alignment. You're doing blank feature filtering, so you're looking at things that are potentially in blanks and having those filtered out of your data. You're doing your targeted peak detection. And at the end, you know, we do this thing where we combine polarities and addicts. So we have both positive and negative mode, remove sodium addicts, retain the highest abundant addict, and combine both positive and negative. So you get a lot of information, and it's nicely formatted in the end to basically see which lipid you have. And there's also a scoring system that tells you how much criteria, how much detail we have for identification. And in case where you have the most, you have a one. So the workflow for doing this, let's say for 150 samples, we do the sample preparation, just to give you an idea of the sense of time it takes. Let's say that takes a couple days. And especially if you're somebody who does this a lot, maybe that could be shortened. We do our instrument analysis, and this takes between five to eight days, depending on how many IEs you do or how many MSM exp experiments you do. You have your actual analysis on your computer, doing feature detection and identification. I guess depending on what kind of um, computer you have, this could take different days. We have a very high proce processing power computer that does this in one to two days. We also have statistics that we have to go through to identify what things are interesting. Maybe a couple days for that. And then understanding the biology of it, who knows, that could take a long time, depending on your system. So anywhere between 11 to 17 days or more is what it would take to get through doing this type of work in our lab. I probably could spend a whole time, a whole hour here, talking about quality assurance and quality control. But this is probably one of the most important aspects of anybody doing omics, whether it be lipidomics, metabolomics, or anything. And so I strongly recommend reading some of these papers that go through all different types of ways of doing quality assurance and quality control, and trying to see how many of those you can implement into your, your experiments. Because I think the strength of your study will be very well uh, received when you try to publish if you have a lot of these in place. So quality assurance are things you do that don't really have an impact on your direct experiment, but they're things that you do that put you in a good position to get good data. Um, most people would be focusing on the quality control aspect, which is what happens during your experiment. So we have things that you can do before your experiment starts, things you can do during your experiment, and things you can do after your experiment that allow you to provide some sort of level of quality control metric to say how good your data is. Just one example, there's lots of discussion about how to set up your batch. So if you have lots of different quality control samples, so you might have uh, some system suitability samples, you might have blanks, you might have pooled samples, you might have reference materials. Lots of different ways of setting up batches that might help you maybe remove some bias or some sort of uh, aspect that might influence your results. So there's a lot of really good information available. Another thing that's become really key in the field of lipidomics and metabolomics is making sure there's a lot of transparency. So at least in lipidomics, uh, it's very much viewed as the wild, wild west. Everybody has the kind of their own methodologies. We all kind of get to the same place, but we take different roads to get there. And I think it's really important if we want to mature as a field that we're very specific and transparent about how we did our analysis from our sample preparation to how we did our identifications. 
And this is something that has become really important in terms of how many people are focusing on this and how many reviews are out there that basically are talking about that if we want to become serious in terms of looking at these as potential biomarkers, we have to be much more transparent across the field. We have to be much more standardized in how we report our information. Within our labs, um, and maybe if you're comparing across labs, there's a few things you can do to help with data validation. You can use method blanks, um, and you can use system suitability standards. Anybody use, anybody use system suitability standards here? OK, maybe a couple. I'll talk about that in a second. There's matrix matched pools. And there's also reference materials. And so some reasons why we'd use method blanks would be to measure carryover, potentially, or maybe some preparation contamination. Obviously, uh, oils on your hands contain lipids. So you want to make sure that you, you're not contaminating your samples. System suitability standards or standard mixtures are things that people are using now to assess instrument readiness. So before you even start putting your samples on the instrument, you run this mix of standards that you know how they run in the mass spec. And you can see whether or not your instrument's forming properly before you even start your study. And this is an important thing because you don't want to be finding out after you've run a bunch of samples that the instrument's not really as sensitive or sturdy or something's happening with the instrument. This is also a great thing to do over time. So if you have this data, every time you run a new batch, you can see whether your instrument performance changes over time as well. You can use matrix max pools. So you can make a pool of your plasma sample or tissue samples or whatever you're looking at. And you can actually measure within batch or between uh, labs or over studies. You can measure the precision. Also, you can do accuracy if you use reference materials that have lipid concentrations. And you can do that within a batch of over studies as well. So there was a, a study that we did uh, several years ago where it was an inner lab study. We gave this reference material, which is a human plasma sample, to a bunch of labs. I think there are over 30 labs, and they all did their lipid measurements, provided concentrations. And what we then came up with was these consensus estimates or consensus concentrations for lipids, where there was at least five labs reporting the lipid. And right here, you can see all the lipid classes on the on x-axis here. And we have a coefficient of dispersion, which is basically like a CV. And we have this cutoff line at 40%. So the lipids that are below that what, that, what that really means is that it didn't really matter what methodology people were using to do the measurement of those lipids. They typically were measured pretty robustly. There the wasn't much of a difference depending on um, the methods they used. Those above that line, that basically means that the methods that were used probably have a large influence on how much was reported. And so those that are below that 40% line, we've actually created a, a document that you can go to that have lipid concentrations of all the individual lipid species. And now people are starting to use those concentrations as a benchmark to see how well they're doing with their work if they use their methods with this material. So it's a way for people now to start uh, QCing each other across the community. So a few more things we can talk about with data validation. So within your samples, we want to pay attention to retention time across samples. So we don't want any drifting. Right? If we have drifting, that could be a chromatographic problem. Uh, sometimes, even within the same matrix type, um, let's say plasma, if you have really starkly different groups within that, you can have matrix effects that might affect retention time. Mac mass accuracy is another thing we want to pay attention to, uh, looking at field blanks or extraction blanks. And then something we do oftentimes, we, we try to randomize our samples in our batch. Um, but we also will oftentimes do PCA to look at whether or not we see any patterns based on run order or batch. So we, we want to make sure that we're not influenced by anything with our experimental design. For annotations of lipids, we want to make sure the retention time order makes sense. So if you, if you have a really long chain lipid that's alluding before a really short chain lipid, obviously that's not what would happen. Uh, we also want to make sure we have the right fragmentation for the identifications we're making. Peak shape is also a very important thing, but probably the most critical as considering biology. So a lot of times when I review papers, uh, people will say, I found this brand new lipid, and it's really interesting, um, but it makes no sense biologically. And so it's really important to consider biology when you're looking at your annotations. So what do we do with the lipid data when we have it? So really, on a basic level, we can do univariate statistics. So we can look at, let's say, normal versus disease, and we can look at individual lipids, and we can do, make these box and whiskers and compare them. 
One of my favorites is using volcano plots. Anybody here use volcano plots? Okay, volcano plots are really nice because you can compare two groups. And so here we're looking at uh, female disease versus female healthy. And you can see a full change on the x-axis and the y-axis you see the significance by a p-value. Uh, so it's really important to have false discovery rate added into your analysis. Um, <clears throat> and what's really cool is that you can generate these nice little boxes where you have things that are the most uh, statistically significant, but also have the greatest full chain. So it gives you an idea of which individual lipids are driving the most difference between the group. You can also look at uh, principal component analysis. Uh, has everybody heard of metabolite analyst? Okay, so if you're not and you're in this field, I would strongly recommend you check it out. It has amazing tools. It's free. Uh, they keep updating it and keep adding different tools to it. Um, this is what we do most of our statistical analysis for our omics with. Once we identify some lipids that are of interest, one thing we also like to do in our lab is we look for a correlation. So we try to find, if we have a set of lipids that we see that are unique, that are different between uh, disease and healthy, we try to see what other lipids correlate with those lipids that we find to be unique. Uh, there's also another software program called Mixomics, where you can actually take your lipid data and combine it with other metadata or other omic data. That's, and there's some really nice tools there. Uh, but lastly, I think the biggest thing that you need to be in the lipidomics field is a detective. So because there aren't really great pathway, uh, pathways that are associated, because we don't really have the structural information about the lipids to the detail we need to understand the biology, you have to look at literature to see what other people are reporting for li lipids that we find of interest and try to piece together what the interesting biological impacts are with what we're studying. A few resources that are of really interest are lipid maps. This is a great resource for lipid structures and ontology. It has all kinds of tutorials, uh, protocols, tools, standards. They even have meetings. And it's aligned with a lot of other lipid organizations. So it's a great way to kind of get connected with what's happening in the community. There's also the International Lipidomic Society, which created a couple years ago. And this is an international society of some of the top lipid researchers that are trying to force the field to be more standardized in how they do lipidomics, how they report data, to try to make the analysis of doing lipids much more standardized and allow us to make it, maybe potentially use these as biomarkers. And they have a really nice website. They just came out with a checklist that is hoping to be used within the community that if anybody is doing lipid analysis, you basically go through, do the checklist, you talk about the exact details of your experiment, and you attach that into supplemental information. So that way, when people are reviewing your study, they can all be reviewed using the same information about how you did your experiment. So there's a really lot, a lot of nice tools, uh, training. There's a lot of nice webinars that are uh, found on this site. There are also um, some really nice lipid conferences. So there's a Gordon Research Conference on lipidomics. That is great. This is the second one, and uh, next year it's in, actually in Italy. So um, that's pretty nice, too. And there's also a fall workshop on lipidomics in November as well. So um, that, check that out if you're interested. And then there's other conferences here that um, you know, maybe tend more focus on the biological side of lipids, but are also really important um, to go to if you're interested in the field. And here's a few other. Uh, Kind of nice reviews. If anybody wants to see the slides, uh, I could, I'd be happy to email them to you. So if you just uh, email me, I could send them to you. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but all the slides had a little box that has, I think, are the kind of seminal papers that you should read if you're interested in those particular topics. Um, but if anybody has any questions, uh, that's all I have for today. Yeah. Right at 11 o'clock. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use a CAT? Like yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so I spent a lot of time using C18, and C18 works really well. I find, though, that the C30 column has a little better separation for the triglycerides. Um, and the triglycerides are kind of a tricky group because there's so many isomers and so many different uh, species. Um, s separating out slightly more kind of helps you identify more. Uh, but yeah, certainly uh, C18 would work perfectly fine. And we have, we have recipes and things. If you email me, I'd be happy to share our, our mobile phases and flows yeah. and things so you can get started with. That answers the question. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs>
Yes? When you say overlapping, you mean overlapping by mass? Yeah. Okay. And they're eluding at the same time? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there are, th so there's topics we didn't get into, but there are mixed spectra. So there are going to be instances where, I don't know if you saw that one triglyceride I showed, with the 16-0, 16-0, 16-1. There were other fragments there. And there was a 14-0, and I believe there was an 18-1. Um, so yeah, you, you will have mixed spectra, and you'll have both of those identified when you get your list of identifications. You won't be able to necessarily say which one is more, you, know, you might be able to say which one's more abundant, but you won't really get the information about the composition of the two, but you'll know they both exist there. So when you get the output, you actually will get both species in that particular output line. You won't know, you won't know exactly the composition of the two, but they both exist there because they both had the information found in the spectrum. Yeah. Well, it, okay, it depends on how detailed you want to get. So, like, a lot of instances where you have something like that, um, you know, we would put a lot of that information in supplemental, right? We have all that, and then maybe we would include a sum composition where we know what the particular carbons are and double bonds, but we don't necessarily know, and we maybe we know the species, but we don't really, the problem is you don't know what percentage of each of those exist within that one spectrum. And so, yeah, you kind of get in the weeds a little bit there. But um, the best thing, I think, always is to report as much information as possible. And, and we put everything in supplemental. So anybody who wants to go through and check what we did, they can. Um, in terms of how you reference it in a paper, I think you have to be conservative there. Um, because if you just say one of the two, you're not really fully representing what was detected with that instrument. Now, there are other technologies you can use to kind of maybe piece together some of those things. And I know people have started to try to look at the abundances of fragments and the total number of fragments and trying to find a relative amount. And there some lipids that works OK, others it doesn't. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a tricky thing. Yeah. I mean, as technology gets better, we're finding more and more stuff. And finding more and more stuff, we find it's more and more complicated. So um, it's, you know, it's part of trying to keep up with the technology.